Hi guys, thank you so much for joining me. And before I kick off with today's true crime case, I'm gonna tell you it's probably gonna be a long one. The research has taken quite a lot of time and I wanted to make sure that I gave some added value if you know this case. So stick with it because I'm sure you're gonna take away some facts and information that you didn't know. Also, it's really close to my heart because we're talking about one of the victims being a baby. I have a baby girl and I may be a little bit obsessed anyway with the area of child safeguarding. So this is one that just lays heavy on my heart and on my head. Also, before I do kick off, I'm sponsoring my own videos right now because I've got my new merch, Armchair Detective. Make sure you get this for Christmas. And also, I am loving my Chase merch. It's a cartoony of my actual cat, Chase, who is just sat down here looking at me with his gorgeous, gorgeous green eyes going, Mummy, why am I not on your lap? So you can get hold of those. And just behind me, I've got my Serial Killer Next Door book. It's actually out in the States in the next week or so, but you can, of course, get it in the UK. Or if you like listening to my voice, the dulcet tones of my voice, then you can also get it on audiobooks. And thank you for all your support. It has been mind-blowing becoming a bestseller, and I get introduced as a bestseller now when people interview me on the radio and stuff and it just takes my breath away because I was never going to write a book and you all asked and asked and asked and you have been so encouraging and I don't read my reviews. My sister is obsessed with reading my reviews. My sister is a really close friend of mine but also she's an English teacher and she's the person who literally made sure that every single spelling was correct in the book before it went to the editors. She has been so helpful in this but she is obsessed with reading them and you have written some really lovely things and of course there have been a few people on there who have not read the book or listened to it and have said some horrible things but it is totally outweighed by the love that you've shown me so massive thank you massive thank you if you do want to get a copy you can look down below in the description there'll be a link there and for those of you who don't want to spend the money on a hardback there will be a softback coming out in about three months time let's talk about today's case that when i started seeing this coming out in the news a while ago this is going back to 2021 time i really had my breath taken away because there was just something so grossly unnatural about what I'm going to talk about today, that it is one of those things that really causes you to question how these human beings are born and how we are created to become such malevolent beings. And I think a lot of you are going to have ideas about who this human being is and what she might be suffering from, which has led to her acting this way. And I would love for you to let me know in the comments your thoughts and feelings on this case, because that is the area that I do spend time reading your comments, as opposed to reviews on Trustpilot about me or on Amazon. Let's talk about Taylor Parker. So when Taylor Parker announced to her friends, her family in the world, that she was pregnant. This is back in January 2020. Her then boyfriend, Wade Griffin, and also those who were close enough to her to celebrate, they were thrilled. She got two children already. She was apparently a decent mother. And whilst her relationship history had been, shall we say, turbulent in nature, she did appear really happy. She seemed excited that she was expecting again and for those of us who have had the joy of being pregnant it is an exciting time you are thinking about the future you're going through those feelings if you've got a partner where you're sharing this journey even though obviously as a woman you're the one dealing with all the symptoms and the swell feet and the morning sickness but it's an exciting experience for you relationally as well because you're starting a new chapter as parents and she shared countless pregnancy photos, she shared her due date, she posted her ultrasound scan. This is the world of social media now, isn't it? No, we share these things with our closest friends and also just a bunch of people that we met once, maybe at a night out and now have become a friend on Facebook. But she's doing all of those normal, regular things that a mum-to-be is going to do. She went to doctor's appointments and she was constantly talking about her pregnancy. But around July to September time, it feels like there is a change in her behaviour. And people who knew her said that there was almost an obsession with her pregnancy. Now, again, some women who are pregnant go through a nesting period. I'm sure that a lot of you will relate to that. And if you haven't had a baby yet, or if you're a guy and you're listening to this, what we talk about nesting is, as you come into the end of your pregnancy, you often have this complete bizarre desire to just totally clean your house from top to bottom. You're like, what I really need to do at 35 weeks pregnant is clean every drawer. 
and reorganize them and label things and vacuum pack clothes that I haven't worn for the last six months. It becomes like an obsession for some women and that's because you are literally nesting. You're creating an environment that is as zen and organized as possible so that your baby is going to be safe. So a lot of women have that. Most of us go through it, but some individuals get almost obsessive. So it could have been that that was happening to her. She was going through the psychological shift of preparedness of being a mother. She's facing imminent birth. But if that were the only obsession that she had, you know, she's online searching for lots of things related to babies, that would make perfect sense. But those searches aren't the only ones that she's doing. Aside from her just doing those normal types of searches, such as making sure that your bag's prepared for your labor, etc., she's starting to look up information about how to fake being pregnant. And even worse, She's looking up information about how to carry out a cesarean section. Now, I get it. People look at different things online. I look at things that are sinister at times. Not illegal, by the way, before anybody jumps on and like, Emma Kent has been on the dark web looking at sinister things. What I'm talking about is gory things. It's just part of my makeup. I am one of those individuals who wants to confront things at times. And that's led me down paths where I've seen things that's relatively traumatic. So I appreciate we all have different search levels on our computer and on our phones. But the last thing as a pregnant parent that I would do is to search cesarean sections, as in a home cesarean section, why would I even need to do that? Even if you're in a scenario where you're going to labour by yourself, the last thing you're going to be doing is carrying out some kind of home cesarean section. So that seems a little bit questionable. Also, she starts to connect online a lot with other mums who are expectant. Now again, people will say, well that's not too odd, you know you're pregnant, you want to meet other pregnant mums, it's an opportunity to connect with people who are going through a similar experience, but there is an obsessive quality and it's not like she's trying to forge and form relationships with these individuals, it's more that she's trying to figure out who is pregnant and who is a mum to be in her area. So it gets to around September 2020 and people who knew her said, listen, one thing that really stood out is that she seemed to be more interested in other people's pregnancies as opposed to her own. And there was almost a stalking element to her following other women online who were indeed pregnant. Her search has therefore introduced her to one of these pregnant women, a girl called Reagan Hancock. She was 21 years of age. She was 34 weeks pregnant. She was living in New Boston, Texas. She was familiar to Parker and the reason for that is they'd cross paths, they weren't friends. There was some kind of connection that had unfolded where Parker was going to take some photographs of Reagan, something to do with an engagement or pregnancy. It never happened because basically Parker said that she wasn't well when that was going to occur but there are not people who know one another very well, they're more people who are aware of each other, there is no bad blood between them but there is certainly no solid connection. Now, by October 2020, Parker's pregnancy is causing, shall we say, some suspicion. It's becoming an issue for people who know her. They're starting to question whether she is indeed pregnant. And even her boyfriend and his family members are getting really suspicious. Her due date seems to be approaching. But as far as they're concerned, she isn't showing those typical signs of pregnancy. But of course, she's resolute. She's absolutely convincing everyone, no, I'm about to give birth. So, on October the 9th, 2020, that's exactly what happens. All those people who had the concerns about her not being pregnant, well, essentially they're going to realise that she must be because at 11.30am that day, she gets stopped by a Texas state trooper in DeKalb, Texas. And the reason for this is she's speeding, her car's driving erratically, and when he pulls her over, Parker is present saying she's just given birth. She says that she's been by the side of the road and that she's given birth to this newborn baby and the baby is in distress. Now the emergency responders immediately rush to the scene. But it feels like from the very get-go, some of them are concerned about inconsistencies in her story. One of the reasons is that one of the first responders is looking at the baby and thinking, not that convinced that the baby has been born in the car. Now whilst this drama is all unfolding, in another area, a horrific discovery is being made. 
21-year-old heavily pregnant Reagan Hancock has been found by her mother, Jessica Brooks, in Reagan's home in New Boston, Texas. Now, on the morning of October 9th, 2020, Jessica, her mother, had gone to Reagan's house. She wanted to check on her daughter. She was heavily pregnant at the time. She was concerned because she'd been trying to contact her. She'd actually been calling. She couldn't get in contact. She ends up calling Homer, who is Reagan's husband, saying, look, I'm really struggling to get in touch with Reagan. And Jessica was so concerned for Reagan that she actually stopped at her granddaughter, Kinley's daycare, on the way to visit Reagan because she thought to herself, look, if Kinley's there, it'll be okay. There'll be some reason that I can't get in contact with Reagan, but it'll be okay. But if she's not there, I know something is really wrong. So she arrives at the daycare center, goes and speaks to one of the workers and says, look, I'm just checking in on Kinley. The daycare worker comes back and tells Jessica, Kinley isn't here. And in that moment, she felt that dread rise in the pit of her stomach. And what I'm talking about here is something that in my field, let me tell you, and I know, because I've been called into question by one of the authorities that I used to have over my work because we pay insurance and subsidies to particular organisations. And I specifically left one organisation because they called me into question for saying that I believe that intuition is really powerful in therapy. I'm with the BACP still, which is an amazing organisation, who fully understand that intuition and instinct are powerful human experiences. They're warning systems. But I actually left another organisation because they called me into question over saying that instinct and intuition are important. They actually said that they weren't and challenged me on that. And I thought I cannot pay any dues to an organisation who's meant to be skilled in psychology, who pretends that our God-given instinct of intuition is not powerfully important. And what I'm talking about now is Jessica, Reagan's mother's intuition as a mother to know there is something badly wrong with her daughter. There is something off about what is playing out right now and she knows it. At that point, she's so worried, in fact, she nearly stops at a police station to go and report that she knows something bad is going to happen. But her husband, Marcus, who she's speaking to at this point in time, he says, listen, just get to Reagan's. Check on Reagan. I cannot even begin to compute what Reagan's mother went through. I really can't. She arrives... And the first thing that she sees, bear in mind, she's already hyper aware that she thinks something bad has happened to her child. And then she's met with streaks of blood on the driveway. So she gets out of her car and sees this. But then she says to herself, you know what? They have dogs. Dogs cut their paws all the time. Dogs leave streaks like that all the time. Reagan and Homer have got dogs. She's trying to just say to herself, it's OK. I'm just letting my imagination run wild. But then she sees more streaks on the driveway and in the garage as she approaches the door. Then something that she notices that takes her breath away is a bloody fingerprint on the doorknob. Now, Jessica's clever because most of us in this moment, when we're already dealing with the worst fear in our mind potentially playing out, you're not necessarily thinking about crime scenes. You're just reacting. But Jessica has this absolute instinct to take off her work shirt and to turn the doorknob because obviously that's going to prevent her fingerprints ending up on there and also going to retain the integrity of fingerprints that may be there already that are incriminating for somebody else. Now as she turns the doorknob and as it opens she sees a bloody shoe print. She hasn't quite opened it enough for the true horror to play out but now she knows without a shadow of a doubt something dreadful has occurred. And then, to her absolute horror, she sees her daughter. Her daughter's on the floor, face down. She's got her arm over her head. She was facing away from her. Apparently her blonde hair was just soaked in red, which clearly was blood. One of the things that her mother, even in that moment of absolute horror, recognised was that something was wrong 
regarding the house. It looked really disheveled. The kitchen was a mess and that was not the way that Reagan and her husband Homer kept their house. They kept the house very clean. Jessica said, I know at this point my daughter's dead. But in spite of that, she's saying, Reagan, Reagan, it's mama. Talk to me, please. Of course, Reagan doesn't answer. At that point, as reality starts to dawn, she gets on the phone and she calls 911. Hysterical, she apparently said, somebody's murdered my baby, she's dead, there's blood everywhere. She begs them, somebody needs to come. Now at this point, because we're talking about a very close family here, her husband Marcus and his best friend, in fact, Chris Hughes, they arrive at Reagan's home. Jessica at this point is just begging her husband not to go in. She didn't want him to see Reagan in that state, but he went in anyway. He came out just screaming, why? Why? His hands over his mouth, apparently he collapsed in the driveway. He was actually having chest pains. He was so overwhelmed with the agony of what he'd just witnessed. He's then clearly aware that there is potentially another victim because Kin Lee is not at daycare, so she's going to be at home and has Kin Lee been murdered as well. So he's calling out for her and they hear nothing. But then finally, thank God, they hear a faint response. Now at this point, he doesn't even want to walk through the blooded living room because it's just so horrific. But he eventually manages to find her baby daughter in the back bedroom. She's frightened. She's sitting under a blanket in her bed. In fact, she was so traumatized by what was playing out. It took her a moment to even recognize that it was him. The minute that she does, she stood up on the bed and she just runs to him. He understandably picks her up, he grabs her blanket, and he even did something that I think demonstrates the compassion level and the care of this family. Because there is one thing I'm going to say about Reagan's family is that they are obviously devoted to one another. And in traumatic situations, it's really hard to keep your head on. I have been through the most traumatic experience of my life when I found my father after his suicide. And I can tell you, any belief in myself regarding how I can deal with those moments dissipated, I was not what I expected to be. And it's really hard to compute the world around you when something so unholy is playing out. But this family are thinking about one another's protection throughout. So you think about Jessica saying to Mark as her husband, don't go in there because she wants to protect him from the scene. And then he has managed to go and get a baby daughter. Now he actually covers her baby daughter's head with a blanket because he wants to protect her. He wants to make sure that Kinley's last moment of seeing her mother is not her face down in a kitchen covered in blood. He then brings her out of the front door. Reagan's husband, he arrives not long after. Now bear in mind, Reagan's husband has got a heavily pregnant partner who he adores and who now he knows something terrible has happened to. Apparently there's a struggle that goes on because all that Reagan's husband Homer wants to do is to go and be with his wife. But Marcus and Marcus's best friend managed to keep him from going inside because they knew, first of all, it was going to be highly traumatic for him to see his wife this way. But secondly, it's a crime scene as well. So any disturbance is going to cause more problems for the investigators and ideally they want to deal with. Now bear in mind, Marcus, his friend, Reagan's mother and Homer, her husband. They've all been witnesses at a crime scene. But imagine having to go through the indignity of basically having those pictures taken, even though it's to discount you as a suspect, when you're dealing with the onslaught of the horror, trauma and grief that you're managing in that moment. When the police arrive, of course, they go in to inspect exactly what's happened. They look and can see that Reagan is clearly dead. She's lay down, face down, with this amount of blood all over the home. The local police actually called the Texas Rangers because they felt that they needed to have assistance with the investigation. This happens a few minutes after 12 that day. They said that they basically needed help with the crime scene because it was unlike any other crime scene that they had ever seen before. This is how rare it was for them to deal with this kind of homicide. They could see that there was a large amount of blood on the floor on the furniture, on the walls, on the appliances that are in the home. It is literally a bloodbath. 
officers at this point have been informed that Reagan was approximately 34 weeks pregnant. So they call EMS because they want them to get to the scene to check on the status of the baby. Because understandably, the woman is dead, the mother is dead. But if there is any possibility, if there is any hope that this child could be brought back to the people who adore them, as in the father and the grandparents, by getting that baby out, then that's something that needs to happen immediately. The EMS arrive, they turn her body over, and it's unbelievable because they aren't looking at a pregnant belly. No, they're looking at this huge incision all the way across Reagan's abdomen. And it's determined there and then that the baby is no longer in her body. So now they're not just dealing with a homicide. They're dealing with a homicide and an abduction of a nearly full term baby. So the minutes are ticking. Somebody is made off with a child. And whoever has done that is also clearly responsible for the killing of this young mother. Officers actually stayed at the house for about 13 hours after that. And they were apparently able, because of the diligence that they applied to that scene, to find out a lot about what had happened at the scene itself. So they could see all the bloody footprints. They could establish pretty immediately that Reagan had been assaulted at the garage door. And then the assault continued literally throughout the house. It was clear that Reagan was trying to escape. It was clear that she was desperately fighting for her life and, of course, for the life of her child. And bear in mind, as Reagan was fighting, as Reagan was trying to save her life and her child's life, she was also aware that her child, her three-year-old daughter, was also in the home. Can you imagine the horror that that mother is going through knowing that there is an assailant trying to kill her, trying to potentially kill her baby? in her belly, and also she knows that she has her beloved child in the house. I cannot even begin to conceive of the agony of that woman's thoughts in her dying moments. She apparently put up a really, really big fight. And as her baby was literally being pulled from her belly, she was fighting. She was fighting hard. In fact, when the baby had been removed, they believed that she tried to go after the assailant, but because of the horrific injuries that she'd suffered and endured, she died. So let's talk about the victim, Reagan Simmons Hancock, a young mother at the very beginning of her life, 21 years of age, who when I say was drenched in love by her family, I mean that entirely. People get lucky sometimes in life, and obviously I'm talking about getting lucky with the turn of events that we're talking about now, which is to also be the most unluckiest person in the world. But I'm talking about when people are lucky to be born to people who truly, unconditionally adore them. That's Reagan Simmons Hancock's life. Her family literally doted on her, and she doted on them. She was born on November the 14th, 1998. She was born in New Hope, Arkansas. Her parents were Jessica and Brandon. Now, they actually divorced not long after her birth, but she was really close to the family. She grew up with several siblings. Both of her parents actually found new partners. So this extended her family. It didn't diminish it. It extended her family. She was extremely close to her mother. They literally talked every single day. When people have talked about Reagan, they said that she was just joy. She was a really happy person. She was said to have a real heart of gold. She was somebody who found it really easy to become fast friends with you. And that's something that works on one level for people because there is nothing more wonderful than meeting somebody who's just open hearted and makes you feel really comfortable and makes you feel safe in their space and just is willing to let you in. But when you are willing to do that, you're also vulnerable because sometimes predators walk through that door and abuse your heart. And that's what we're talking about in this case. When she was a teenager, she met Homer, her husband, Homer Hancock and her fell in love. So this is a story of young love flourishing. They had the first little child, a little girl named Kinley, and she literally featured all over Reagan's social media. It's clear that she adored her daughter. Reagan and Homer actually got married in September 2019. And then in August 2020, she announced her second pregnancy. She was so happy. 
The family lived together in New Boston, which is a city that is about 160 miles northeast of Dallas. It's got a population of 4,600 people. So it's a small town. It's a small place. And there is something really beautiful, I think, about small worlds. People have big dreams, don't they? And sometimes I think ultimately those big dreams dissuade you from what make you really happy. We know what makes people happy. It's great relationships. It's a supportive network. It's feeling that you have meaning to those who mean to you. And often we are sold a lie and have these bigger ideas that don't play out and fill us and fulfill us in life as we've been told they will. But it feels like Reagan was living that small community, big heart, full of love life and it was working so well for her. She was so excited that she had a second child on the way. She came from an incredibly loving and close-knit family. Her parents were Jessica Brooks and she also had her stepfather, Marcus Brooks. They were deeply involved in Reagan's life. They provided loads of support, loads of care. They were excited about her second baby as well. So the family have this incredibly tight bond and one of the things that Reagan clearly inherited from her parents was that they were very family orientated and that they as a unit all connected and spent a great deal of time with one another. The fact that we are talking about somebody at the very beginning of her life being excited for her future, it's so sad that we're covering the demise of somebody so full of potential. She was warm, she was vibrant, she cherished people, she was radiant, she was really nurturing. These are all the words of people that knew her. And one of the things that people said about Reagan was that she was just absolutely dedicated to being a mother. She was absolutely invested in her little girl and she couldn't believe she was having another baby girl to welcome into the family. Those joyful updates that she shared on social media, the showcasing of her pregnancy was all about being excited. It's all about the hope and love that she had for this growing family. It was all about potential. And whenever I cover cases of murder, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the death of that potential. And I think one of the things that really came across to me in the research is that Reagan was really open-hearted and really generous. And generosity, again, it's a double-edged sword. It's so lovely to be kind, it's so lovely to be good, and psychologically we want to be around people who are warm and generous, but it also means that people can exploit you. And it means that you're less aware of negative intentions of others because you see everybody through rose-tinted spectacles. And that's not a quality people should lose, but it just makes you aware that sometimes people will take advantage of you. And another note before I carry on with this, one of the things that really spoke to me in the research as well was about Homer and Reagan's relationship. Homer considered her his absolute best friend. And I think there is something just so beautiful about young love, isn't there? When it works and when you connect and when you find each other early and you share that history, it can mean that your relationship can go on to be really, really strong. So here we are in a situation where one mother has just gone through an absolutely traumatic birth in her own vehicle by the side of the road and another mother has lost her life in the most traumatic of circumstances and this has happened in quite a small radius and there's another interesting connection because Taylor Parker and Reagan kind of know each other they're not good friends but they've moved in the similar social circles and also Taylor Parker was meant to take some engagement photographs of Reagan but this never actually happened because apparently Taylor Parker was ill at the time. That relationship, therefore, means that they were on relatively friendly terms. But like I said, this photography session was the real reason that they got to know one another. It allowed Taylor Parker to ingratiate herself into Reagan's life. It meant that she could build trust. They could build a kind of friendship because she was posing as somebody who liked her and wanted to do nice things for her. And of course, they were both pregnant at the same time. And anyone who has been pregnant and knows somebody of a similar age framework who is also pregnant is kind of cool because you think, you know, we're going to share similar experiences we're probably going to move in the same network and it's kind of nice to be nice but they're not firm friends they just kind of know each other and the fact that Reagan is such a lovely open-hearted person it's not hard for Taylor Parker to insert herself to some degree on a level in Reagan's life so let's just take a moment to look at who Taylor Parker is because guys wow it is unusual for my breath to be taken away by a kind of character that I explore and research in these cases, but Taylor Parker did it. 
Where shall I start? I guess we can start with the understanding that Taylor Parker was a very complex individual. She had a troubled history, and most of that troubled history comes from her deception, her manipulation. I would say there is an absolute instability in her nature. She was born to Shauna Pryor and Mark Morton. They were together until 2005, and after they split up, the couple split custody at first. So Taylor and her younger brother, Zachary, they stayed in the family home and her parents actually switched every other week. So they did 50-50 custody, and they made sure that the children had a secure base and were familiar to their environment by basically moving out of the home every other week so the other parent could come home. Her mother said that that arrangement didn't actually last very long because her ex-husband didn't take the split well, and he really struggled with the idea of leaving, which is the problem. You know, if you're doing 50-50 custody and your ex comes and spends a week at home and then won't leave, you're going to have an issue. So she said that then led to some escalation, shall we say, in front of the kids. So the parents were fighting in front of the children, which is not ideal. And this meant that the children would end up going to her mother's house when it was her turn to look after them. So she would take them to the grandmother's house so they didn't have to deal with that conflict. So whatever was going on with the parents is not ideal, but clearly mum, in this case, tried her best to minimise the impact on the children. Apparently the children were not forced to stay at the grandparents if they didn't want to. And when Taylor didn't want to go, she would actually go and stay with her father or go to his mother's. So she had that option. Taylor's mother said that because of that, because they didn't want to force the children to go where they didn't necessarily want to go, Taylor Parker ended up spending more time with her father and her brother spent more time with her, their mother. And Parker's mother said that Peggy was one of those women who basically used food as comfort. So Parker actually started to do the same and she starts to gain a lot of weight when she was around 13. Now, by the age of 14, she'd actually weighed at this point around 250 pounds and she was really unhappy about this and what we're talking about there is obviously a symptom of unhappiness she's emotionally eating she's filling herself with food to accommodate maybe a sense of loneliness and emptiness inside and even though that works in the short term because it makes you feel full for a temporary amount of time it doesn't emotionally keep her going so now she's got the issue with whatever she's dealing with emotionally which is clearly unhappiness, sadness, loneliness, but she's also dealing with what she looks at in the mirror and she's not happy with her 250 pound self. At this point, Taylor Parker drops out of high school and she actually gets pregnant just after turning 17. So she carries on with that pregnancy. She has a daughter. The father of that child was not at all involved in her life. Her mother didn't actually recall how Parker and her baby daddy related because she didn't really see him during the pregnancy or after the birth. So she didn't have a comment about what he was like in Parker's life. But what we do know is in 2014, Parker was so unhappy with her body that she actually went to Mexico, had a gastric bypass. And this is because apparently a doctor said that her obesity was starting to cause heart problems. Then we get to 2014, she's had that surgery, and she ends up marrying a guy called Tommy Wakasi. They have a son together. After the birth of her second child, Taylor opted for tubal ligation. Now, I think that's really strange. Genuinely, I appreciate that every woman has a right to do whatever she wants with her body, but I think when you're having your tubes tied at an early age and you've only got a couple of kids you don't know how you're going to feel down the line look at me i'm an elder mum i had two boys when i was young and i'm old now and i've got a baby girl because you're not quite aware of who you're going to be down the line but for whatever reason she decided that she wanted tubal ligation her mother wasn't told about that so she kept it secret now we get to august 2015 and taylor parker ends up having surgery because she was having pelvic pain she was having bleeding and they were able to confirm during the surgery it was endometriosis but also she was having an ectopic pregnancy now the doctor at this point recommended a hysterectomy bear in mind she's under anesthesia so that decision was made for her by her mother and her husband I can completely understand in that moment, it's all about saving the life of a parent, not being too concerned about the future, but it must be very debilitating if somebody makes a decision over you having a hysterectomy that you don't want. I also will counter that by saying, if she's had her tubes tied, then 
we can understand that the doctor's going to think she doesn't want any more children and this is going to be the best for her in the long term. Now, Taylor Parker did express a bit of anger about having a hysterectomy. Apparently, she was planning on having more children, which feels a little bit rich if you've had your tubes tied because clearly she'd elected to not have any more children before, but now it's been taken out of her control. She's decided, oh, actually, I did want to have more children. But as I said, that doesn't make sense when you think about her history. Now, around Thanksgiving 2015, Taylor Parker starts to experience stroke-like symptoms. She apparently called her mother around 4 a.m. with a headache. She was seeing stars. Later that day, people noticed that her face looked different when I was drooping. She ends up going to the ER. She was actually put in ICU, and then she was later transferred to hospital where she stayed for the next two weeks. Doctors didn't actually find any signs of a stroke, and they did this thorough workup, and in the end, they diagnosed her with complicated migraines. It was at this point suggested that there could have been a possibility of her having MS. And while she was actually waiting for an appointment with a specialist, Taylor Parker took the suggestion that she may have MS and she actually found a local support group. Now, after the tests that she had, it was confirmed that she didn't have any MS, but she was at this point told to see a psychologist. Now, I would say at this point, what we have is a woman who is looking to pin certain feelings on physical issues, a stroke, MS, and so on and so forth. And I wouldn't say it's completely uncommon that we are struggling with our psychology and want to make it physical because we think physical symptoms can be managed. And often we can't compute that psychological experience can make us feel physiologically unwell. Often we believe that they are two separate things. They're not. Your brain and your body is connected. And what happens up here affects down here. So it makes perfect sense that when you've gone through a litany of tests and nobody can find anything wrong with you, that you are referred to a psychologist because it is unbelievable the kind of things that mental health can cause on your body. Stress alone can kill you. But the fact that she's seeking out support groups, the fact that she's looking at ways to stand out for a condition suggests that there is a potential within her that she wants some kind of visibility. She maybe believes that her life isn't amounting to what she wishes it to amount to, and she wants to stand out in certain areas and arenas, whichever area arena that is, whether it's good or bad. Now, Parker and Tommy end up divorcing. Tommy was given custody of their son, and he later down the line said that Parker was ordered to pay child support, but she never paid a dime to him. Not long after they divorced, Parker met Hunter Parker. At this point, they married, and according to Hunter, she never told him that she couldn't have kids. Now, she had told some of her friends that she couldn't have children, but she changed her story here. She didn't say that she had a hysterectomy during routine procedure. She said that she had uterine cancer. It's another lie. So she wants to amplify the issues that she's struggled with. And also, when somebody tells you they've had cancer, you take it really seriously, particularly a young person. You're like, that's so unfair. And it builds bonds. It's a quick way in where you feel sorry for somebody, understandably and rightfully so, and you want to hear their story because you're interested and intrigued about what they've been through. In April 2019, her marriage to Hunter ends. Bear in mind how quickly these relationships are ending. The turbulence and toxicity is absolutely clear and abundant in her relationships. At this point, Taylor Parker begins dating Wade Griffin. They'd apparently met at a rodeo in July 2019. They started talking through social media. They very soon get into a relationship. Now, whilst this is happening, Taylor Parker is in financial distress. So in late 2019, early 2020, so she's out there making big purchases that she can't afford. So she's putting them on credit cards. So she's lying about money at this point. She's also creating this idea about who she is as a human being and that she comes from wealth and she's got property in her family. And she's painting this picture that will be really attractive to Wade. She's a woman of means and who would not want to be with somebody who's got money? It brings you financial security. It makes somebody more attractive, not because you are somebody who's hungry to take from them. It just makes people feel more successful. Now, in spite of the fact that she's pretending to weigh that she's got cash, they end up getting in debt because of the fact that they're spending beyond their means and he thinks that she's got money available to her. Taylor Parker then says that she's suddenly pregnant 
with Wade Griffin's child. Bear in mind, she's had a hysterectomy. There's absolutely no way on God's earth she's pregnant. Now, people in her family, including her mother, they're aware that she can't get pregnant. Bear in mind, they know this. And why do they know this? Because they agreed for her to have the hysterectomy when she was under anaesthetic and couldn't make that decision herself. But in spite of the fact that they're fully aware, Taylor Parker is still pretending she is indeed pregnant. Now, I don't know about you guys. I don't know about you guys. But if my sister turned up and was like, pregnant, Emma, I'd be like, no, you're not. No, I am pregnant. I'm pregnant. You're definitely not pregnant because you can't have any children anymore. No, I'm pregnant though. Did you get a visitation? I'm going to throw it out there by big white light. No. Did you have, I don't know, three wise men turn up? No, that didn't happen. Any kings been in the area? No. Is there a really bright star just above your house? Maybe lambs and sheep hanging around. Is there a manger? Is there a manger anywhere? No, none of that. Right, you're definitely, definitely not pregnant. If my sister then was like, I've just announced it online. I'd be like, right, we are going to the hospital immediately because you need help. Yeah, I know I'm pregnant. No, you're not pregnant. You are actually delusional. We're going to drive to, what, what are you doing? I'm getting in this manger. No, you're not getting in this manger, Alexia. Step away from the manger. Sorry, I'm going down the nativity route right now. What I'm saying is I would out her 100%. You can't go around messing with people's feelings when you know that person is definitely not Pregnant. Now, other people apparently question the pregnancy, but she made up these elaborate lies, these stories, because she wanted Wade Griffin, her partner, to believe that he was going to be your father. So it's clear that we're talking about somebody who's had turbulent relationships, toxic relationships. Now we're dealing with a high pattern of deceit and real trouble in her mindset. When people have talked about who she was growing up, They've said that she was someone who always craved attention and from the get-go, they knew she was a compulsive liar. Those lying traits seem to escalate over time. So the more she grows into her adult life, the more elaborate the lies begin. She's cultivating this image that's inconsistent with reality. She's making stories up about herself. These range, by the way, from the grandiose achievements to personal hardships. So she'll go from one extreme to the other and it's all about eliciting sympathy or getting attention. She's basically creating scenarios where people who form relationships with her can't stay in those relationships because she's ultimately completely untrustworthy. Some people described her as charming, at least on the surface, somebody who could quickly build rapport, but then as you get to know her, they realise that everything she presented was false. And that's fundamentally why she's always losing these relationships, because no one wants to be around her. Now, in spite of the fact that people know that she's not actually pregnant, because it would be impossible for her to be pregnant, Wade Griffin, her boyfriend, he thinks she is. And he's eagerly anticipating the birth of his much-wanted child. And Parker is good at using these lies. She's very effective at lying. Even though people find her right in the long run, for a short period of time, she can create these scenarios and make people buy into it. She's manipulating his emotions. She's getting him prepared for his imminent fatherhood. And he's completely on board. But of course, she's aware that there's going to be D-Day. There's going to be the point where she either presents him with a child or he realises that this has been a lie. And it's not as if she can pretend that she's miscarried, which she has done in previous relationships many times. This time, she's gone so far that if she were to lose this child, well, there would need to be a death certificate, there would need to be an actual funeral because that's what happens when you're past a certain pregnancy point. So she has cut it real fine now, and she knows. Provide this child imminently, or the house of cards is going to topple. So now, with all this mounting stress, and with no baby in her belly, with this all just totally fabricated, with Wade, her boyfriend, waiting for his baby to be delivered, she's got the reality of her inevitable exposure occurring. And so recognising that everybody is going to be aware that she's a liar, she decides, instead of just to face the music, 
instead of to say, you know what, I have been conning you. Because that's an option, right? You can just confront truth. You can just say, I am a liar. Hey, you know what? Leave the area. Just up and go. You can do all of those things. But she doesn't want to. She's so bought into this fabrication. She's so convinced herself that she can get away with this. That instead of doing what I've just said, instead of leaving, instead of telling the truth, she makes the most horrific decision that any woman could do. And that decision is to steal another woman's baby. But not just to steal another woman's baby, to murder a woman for her baby. Of course, that isn't the story that she tells the Texas State Trooper who pulls her over when she's doing that speeding and erratic driving. No, when he looks into that vehicle, when he's in shock, looking at this young woman who's got blood over her and she's got this premature baby in her arms, he believes he's there to help somebody who has just had a traumatic experience. He realises from the get-go there's something weird about the way she is. She's really insistent about going to a specific hospital, the McCurtain Memorial Hospital in Idabel, Oklahoma, which is about 10 miles from the Texas border. She informs the officer that she's given birth, that the newborn's in distress. She's pleading with the officer, saying that essentially the baby's needing some help. She wants to evoke this urgency. Of course, we know she's excellent at getting sympathy when she needs it. He looks at the blood, he looks at her erratic behaviour, and he feels there's just something not right happening. But of course, he can see that there's a baby in distress. It needs immediate attention, so they call for help. This is when, I would say, everything very quickly falls apart. When first responders arrived, the LifeNet EMT, somebody called Kelly Gerald, said he absolutely believed at that moment in time that she'd just gone through the trauma of giving birth in a car, and even worse, that she may be losing her baby. He'd actually lost a child himself, so he really empathised with her. He held her hand. He even tried to comfort her on the way to the hospital. But another first responder, LifeNet EMT paramedic Elton Crossland said, from the get-go, there was just something off about what he was being told. So Parker tells him she was driving down the road when she just felt her waters break and she said the baby just came out. Now, there'll be some woman listening to this going, that happened to me, I get it. It does happen occasionally. I've been through three labors and God willing that that were the case, that they just came out, ideally surfing as your waters break. But for most of us women, you know, there's a little bit of a prelude called contractions with your body, getting ready to get out a watermelon through something the size of a lemon. It's not usually just something that happens, but at the end of the day, that's the story she says. Now, that EMT said, look, I looked at the car. Immediately, I knew that baby was not born in the car. Childbirth's messy. They expected amniotic fluid, blood. Also, the immediate thing that they noticed was that the amniotic fluid on the baby was dry. And that meant the baby hadn't just been born. The EMT said, if it had only been a several minutes since the baby had been born, it would not look like that. Also, the condition of the umbilical cord, that indicated that the baby had not been born minutes before. Now, all they're concerned about at this moment in time is to save that child. They give the baby epinephrine, they intubate her, and then they continue with CPR. They're helping her breathe with a bag, which is obviously going to help get her oxygen in. They get a heartbeat, which is something that's incredibly exciting for them because they're thinking they're dealing potentially with a dead baby and now all of a sudden they may be able to save the baby. So according to those first responders, they felt really happy. In fact, they said they were on cloud nine. They said when they got the pulse back, they thought, wow, you know, this is awesome. But that excitement will last because despite their best efforts, the baby was pronounced dead at the hospital. Now, bear in mind, Parker, she hasn't thought past this action. She hasn't anticipated the fact that she isn't dealing with people that she can just flippantly lie to. We're talking about schooled medical professionals. We're talking about dyed in the wool investigators and detectives. You can't just say something and get them to accept it. A medical scrutiny in particular 
It's very specific if you've had a baby. So you're going to know as a medical person if somebody's actually given birth. But she hasn't thought about that. Because the thing about Parker is she's reactionary. She deals with things moment to moment. So she isn't thinking long term, she's reacting to the situation as it unfolds. And that means you haven't got the level of preparedness. You're not sophisticated enough in your deception to actually be in a situation where you can get away with such a massive lie. It just isn't going to work. But she hasn't computed that because she deals with moment to moment. That's why she constantly lies to a point where she gets found out. Because if you're a consummate liar, the aim of the game is to not get found out. All we have in her history is being found out time and time and time and time again, being rejected time and time and time again, being abandoned because she is so deceptive time and time and time again. She is not a consequential thinker. So when she gets to the hospital, the staff immediately start to question her. There are so many discrepancies, both in her story, but also in her physical condition and the condition of the baby. Now, to add problems to her very quickly dissolving story, she's unwilling to be examined internally. Now, let's be real. No one likes an internal examination. We're not lining up going, please do that. Have a look down there. It's you know one of those things that causes a level of indignity. But when you've had a baby, you really don't care. I swear to God. Once you've had a baby and you've got it out, all you're concerned about is your baby. They could parade you naked down the street on your hospital trolley. You wouldn't even be focusing. You'd just be like, this is a bit weird being outside. I hope I'm going to get a blanket soon. It's just not where your head is. You can go through all of those examinations without even thinking about it. The fact that she's resisting this when they're trying to help her, and that's all they've tried to do so far is to help her, that makes her seem really, really suspicious. And then they test the HCG levels. They give her an ultrasound. And guess what? Her HCG levels show she's not been pregnant. And her ultrasound shows that there's not been a pregnancy there. So they know, right from the get-go, this woman has not given birth to this baby. And that means that there is a baby who should be with a mother who is not present with that parent because this woman is pretending the child is hers. So this has created this whole change in how serious this issue is. Now, detectives who attend the hospital, they know. They know that there is no way she has had this child. But of course, they have to go through the motions of asking her what happened that day. Now, bear in mind, at this point, they've also heard from others that 21-year-old Reagan had been found murdered in her own home. They know that Reagan had had her womb sliced open and her baby stolen. But they have to humour Parker at this point. They ask her if she went into labour at the side of the road. She affirms that this is the case. She says elaborately that her partner Wade was going to go with her, but he'd been caught up at work. All the while, the detective knows she's lying. All the while, he's looking at this woman who he knows has slaughtered potentially another young woman and stolen her baby. I'm just going to be up front with you. I've been talking to the DA down in uh, Booty County and they've been working on a case down there. And we know that you had a hysterectomy some time back and that you claimed to be pregnant for a while, but it really weren't. So I'm trying to figure out where this baby came from. But you didn't get birth this morning. What do you... What do you mean? So I just said, you didn't get birth this morning. We want to know where this baby came from. So what happened? I just told y'all what happened. Okay. What's the doctor going to find when he comes in and check you? Is he going to find you just gave birth? I, they can tell. When he looks, he can tell in about a second if you gave birth or not. Okay. There's no way you could make it. I didn't hurt anybody on the side of the road. Well, I'm not saying you did. I'm just saying that there's a there's a woman that had her baby removed from her body. Her body's found on the side of the road. I 
I didn't say you did. Okay, so let me I just want to know what happened where this baby came from. He starts to ask her questions about the internal check because she's resisted it. And it makes it very difficult for her because at the end of the day, you've got nothing to hide and they just want to check that she's not hemorrhaging after all. Why would you resist? He also notices that she's got blood all over her hands. So the hospital staff are very cleverly manipulating her to say, I have to agree to this because if I don't agree, it's going to look really weird. I've got blood all over me, which could suggest that I'm hemorrhaging and yet I'm resisting having an internal. So reluctantly, she agrees to have the internal. At this point, before it happens, she's asked by the detective what she'd had. And she tells him she's given birth to a little girl called Clancy Gale. Bear in mind, all the while this is being asked, that detective knows she is lying. And he just says, I know you haven't given birth because I know you've had a hysterectomy. And that means you are not the mother of this child. Now in that moment, there's nowhere to go. Literally, she's bound to rights. They know that she's not had the baby. They've got the medical evidence that she's not had the baby. They know that a woman's been murdered somewhere without now having a baby present with her because that baby's been taken. And yet she just carries on saying, well, that's not true. I have given birth. But the detective then says, listen, we found a woman who's been murdered. We found a woman whose baby has been cut from her body. Again, at this point, Taylor Parker just goes quiet, but she acts like she doesn't know what's going on. She's then examined, the doctor confirms she's absolutely not had a baby. And the detective at this point says, look, we know you are responsible for the murder. We know, in fact, that now you're responsible for a double homicide because the baby has died as well as the mother. Now, the detective is very clear from the get-go. You are responsible. Right now, the DA down there who I've talked to believes that you're a cold-blooded killer and that you plotted for the last eight months to get to murder this woman and steal her baby. And right now, the evidence is there. They can prove it without a shadow of a doubt that that's what happened. They can prove that you murdered that woman. I think this is some woman, but you know, everybody's happy, they're having showers, and then somebody comes along and cuts her damn baby out of the gut. That's what we got right now. And that's what you need to understand. That's the point where we're at. We're past all this nonsense about, I wasn't there, I didn't kill nobody. We're past all of that. We know it, we know you did it. There's no doubt whatsoever. Now, of course, Taylor is just steadfast in her lie. She's saying that she doesn't know what's happened to the baby. She had the baby, that she doesn't know the woman that they're accusing her of harming, even though they've got links. So that lie will be exposed again. So like I said, no consequential thinking, but the detective keeps making it clear that she's guilty. She finally, accepts at that point at least that she'd been involved she said that her head had been hurting she relates this back to a stroke that she had in 2015 which by the way we know she didn't actually have because she lies about everything and they confirm she didn't actually have a stroke but this is a story she's telling them she then said that basically it wasn't her fault and this is where like i said when somebody is a liar and they're not prepared for the next lie so they're just doing it on the hoof they cannot string something together with logical sense. They can't do it. And it becomes wild and bizarre. So this is a story that Taylor Parker tells. She says that Reagan had actually allowed her over to her home. Apparently she needed to take a shower. So Reagan had said, okay, come over, take a shower. And at this point, Reagan from nowhere, gets into a physical altercation with her. Reagan, who is heavily pregnant, decides that she wants to have some kind of physical dispute with Parker. So she and Parker start fighting. But of course, it wasn't Parker who initiated the violent assault. No, 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 no. It was Reagan. So she's clearly trying to frame this situation now where she's just gone round to have a shower and ultimately, Reagan has caused this horrendous scenario to unfold that she had no knowledge was going to play out, and she was just some kind of blameless victim. Now, on one level, this is an attempt to say there's no premeditation, that she hadn't gone round there to do anything awful, and that she therefore cannot be framed as somebody who's taken part in a first-degree homicide. But equally, she's just trying to deflect any guilt, and it's 
really bizarre that she thinks she would ever be able to get away with it. She says this argument begins, it escalates, the situation spiralled out of control, and during this physical altercation that apparently Parker didn't want, Reagan hits her head on the table and is killed by accident. I mean, genuinely, it's so bizarre, but it's also so disrespectful. We're talking about a young mother of 21 years of age who's had her baby ripped from her belly and has died whilst her own three-year-old daughter is in the home and this woman who has stolen that baby and killed that baby too is now saying that Reagan was the person who caused the situation to unfold where she has been killed. And also, it doesn't make sense with the injuries that we'll talk about shortly, but this is a story she's telling. She also said that Reagan was the person who took the knife and she ended up getting hurt by it. So again, apparently Reagan gets the knife, they then both end up with it, she pushes Reagan and Reagan falls on the knife conveniently. So she constantly plays it off as Reagan being the aggressor, this woman who's heavily pregnant, the aggressor apparently. Then, to add insult to injury, she asserts that Reagan, who's heavily pregnant, who is not in any fit state to argue or fight, she says that she starts to hit herself with a heavy object and tells Taylor Parker that she's going to pin the blame on her. Now, there is nothing comedic about what I'm saying. If we were talking about this in some kind of fictitious comedy, then maybe that would be funny because of the fact that there is no way on God's earth that some woman is going to be getting a heavy object, hitting herself on the head to damage herself beyond repair so that she could blame some other person in the home, even though she's never going to get that to play out because she'll be dead. But that's what Parker is saying. Then Parker actually tells the detectives that apparently Reagan begged Taylor Parker to save her baby as she knew she was dying. Can you even begin to compute what I've just said? I mean, can you imagine hearing this as a detective? So let me just get this right. You're saying that you went round to the house completely peacefully. Yeah. And then let me just get this right again. You're saying that Reagan came to the door. She did. She came to the door. And then what did you argue about? I haven't really thought that far ahead. It's just an argument. It's some kind of like argument. It's just an argument. What specifically did you argue about? Again, I, I like, I want to tell you exactly specifics, but I can't because it was just so, it was so left field. I wasn't prepared for it. So when it happened, I just don't remember anything. But you do then remember exactly what happened after that. Yeah, I do actually, even though I don't remember anything about what escalated the situation and caused the argument in the first place. I do remember that I was trying to like, you know, de-escalate because I'm a really good person. But unfortunately, Reagan, are we talking about Reagan who was really heavily pregnant? Yeah, that one. So she just goes wild and she ends up just hitting me and I'm just defending myself and then she just falls on a table and she hits her head and it's like a really serious injury. But then she thinks like, I'm really angry with Taylor so I'm going to pick this up and I'm going to hit myself in the head. And I'm saying like, don't do that to yourself. And she's like, I'm going to do this to myself so I can blame you. And then there's a knife and I'm trying to get the knife off her because I'm a really good person. And then she falls into the knife. Sorry, are you injured? Are you injured at all in this? Are you injured? Because it sounds like some really serious altercation. Are you badly injured at this moment in time? No. I don't know why, but apparently, even though all these things are playing out, I just defended myself a bit like some kind of Marvel superhero. Anyway, she's really badly stabbed, and then she's lying on the floor, and she's caused all these injuries to herself, and then she's like, please take my baby. So I took a baby. So the woman who apparently is that angry with you that she is trying to harm herself to a point of near death with a heavy object is now begging you to take her baby. Do you know what I'm going to go and do now? No. We've got this new machine. It's called the human lie detector. Okay. Okay. Well, I won't need to go in there because I'm not somebody who lies. Yeah. Well, that's good because we would like somebody who never lies to go in. And if you just walk through that door over there, just walk through the door. This door. Yeah. It's just this door says incinerator. Mm hmm. Does it? Yeah. Like, it says, it says incinerator. I think there's actually a little temperature gauge and the temperature gauge is like, well, it goes off at a thousand degrees C and it just looks like it carries on. Yeah, well, just walk through that door and um, 
we'll have somebody come in and see you later. Go on then, go on. Anyway, that didn't happen. But you know where I'm going with this? It's ludicrous that this beautiful young woman desperate for her second child is begging Taylor Parker to take the baby. Sociopath does not cut it where this woman is concerned. And the fact that she says to the officer, I don't know what's wrong with me during that conversation. I think we can all have a guess, can't we? Massive psychopath, just gonna throw it out there. Massive psychopath. Now bear in mind, all of that took place when Reagan's three-year-old daughter was with her. And also another thing that the police realized was that Parker went round to Reagan's home with three knives in a purse. Absolute premeditation. But to be honest, they didn't need that evidence anyway because the forensic evidence absolutely painted the most sinister and deliberate picture of this killing. It was clear that Parker had meticulously planned the murder. Like I said, she'd brought tools with her. She'd come to Reagan's house with a scalpel, which she clearly used to cut Reagan's abdomen to get the baby out. Reagan suffered the most brutal assault. It showed that she, as I said earlier, fought for her life. The blood splatter alone showed that she was desperately fighting, but she got multiple blunt force injuries consistent with being hit with a hammer. When they did the autopsy, the violence she endured was staggering, literally staggering. It was clear it was a brutal and premeditated attack without a shadow of a doubt. So as I've mentioned, she had multiple injuries to her head. The autopsy also confirmed the large incision in her abdomen and that cut was made very crudely with a scalpel. That was how then Taylor Parker forcibly removed the unborn baby from Reagan's womb. It wasn't made in a medically precise manner. That meant that it caused additional bleeding, additional damage. There was clear defense wounds on Reagan's body. It was obvious that she fought for her life. And those wounds evidenced just how desperately she attempted to resist Parker's assault. Now we get to October 2020, Taylor Parker at this point faced several charges due to the utter brutality of a crime. So she was charged with capital murder that was for the killing of Reagan Hancock during the commission of another felony, which was stealing Reagan's unborn child. Then she was charged with kidnapping, that was for the abduction of the baby that she forcibly took from Reagan's womb. There was tampering with a corpse, that was obviously due to the gruesome manner in which she attempted to extract and abduct the unborn baby from Reagan's body. She went ahead, in spite of the overwhelming evidence, to plead not guilty. Honestly. So Parker's plea, because she said she was not guilty, that set the stage for a trial, which is going to be highly traumatic for the family of Reagan. And again, it's indefensible as far as I'm concerned. It's clear that she killed this young woman and also her baby. So the defence are basically going for this route where they're saying, look, this wasn't actually a long-term scheme to steal a baby. It was just a result of a chaotic, impulsive act. So they're genuinely trying to portray her as this mentally unstable woman where she's had this psychological breakdown in this moment of desperation. And of course, they have to go through the fact that she had a history of lying, both about previous experiences in life, also about being pregnant, and saying, well, you know, she's always lied. And because she's always lied, you know, that probably means that her mental health was compromised. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. People with mental health issues, people with mental illness, they don't lie. That's not how it works. You have people who have major, major antisocial personalities. They lie, but that's a personality disorder of a whole different level. Not mental instability. They're cruel, narcissistic psychopaths on the whole. What we're talking about here is somebody who does have a history of lying because she's a massive liar. But this is what they're saying. That basically her mental state's compromised and that she had this unplanned act of violence. Unplanned act of violence. She brought three knives she brought a scalpel. How unplanned is it? Now, I don't know about you. If you were to just go, Emma, Emma, you're the kind of person who's quite transparent. I am. I'm quite transparent. Emma, do you know what I'm going to ask you to do? Go on. I want you to go and get your rucksack. My rucksack? Yeah, go and get your rucksack. Okay, why do you want to see my rucksack? I just want to see the kind of things that you will have in your rucksack. Okay. Said rucksack presented. Emma? Are you planning for an apocalypse? You may think it's strange, but I often think if I were to break down, I could live for three weeks on the supplies in this book. It's as simple as that. So 
if we happen to be stranded somewhere, let's say a flood occurs and we're just on this little island, you'll be very grateful for the rug, the supplies, the chocolate bars and so on and so forth in this bag. What I'm saying is at no point would you be like, Emma, why is there a hacksaw, an axe, a scalpel and why are these electrical cords in here? And by the way, is that a ski mask? That's not going to happen because I'm not a serial killer. So I don't have things like that. She had a scalpel with her and other tools. How is that not cold, calculated and premeditated? Now the defense, they're obviously trying their best because they're like, we have to put scraps. We're clearly defending a narcissistic sociopath with a compulsive lying history. We have no way of winning this. What can we do to try to stop her ending up with the death sentence? We'll go for, oh, frontal lobe damage. Now, if you have frontal lobe damage, if that's real, you're going to be more impulsive. That's where I have a problem with this. I don't know who was running the defence and why they came to these conclusions, but I would say, if you're going to try to get an expert, and they did, come in to say that they might have an issue with frontal lobe concerns about her, and impulsivity is why they would be arguing that, because, you know, it's not premeditated, it's impulsive, and this brain issue shows and demonstrates why she's impulsive, we'd be like, oh, well, that's terrible that in that moment they made that split-second decision. However, if you're trying to say that she is impulsive, but we're dealing with somebody who spent nine months planning, that doesn't sound very impulsive. That sounds the exact opposite of impulsive. So even if she's meant to have this frontal lobe issue, it would be that she was therefore symptomless because she literally spent nine months planning it. Just throwing it in there. Also, no other experts found this, so we can all agree it's a bit of BS, can't we? Now the prosecution, I would say they had a very easy case because it's clear to all people who look into this that the only person that is a cold-blooded killer is Taylor Parker and that she without doubt premeditated what she was gonna do to poor Reagan. And yes, she may have decided at the last minute that it was Reagan who was going to die, but some woman would have died because she was taking a baby come what may. They showed extensive evidence of Parker's planning, the intent, the internet searches on how to fake a pregnancy, how to perform a C-section, how to commit crimes involving abduction. They showed a woman who had methodically plotted the attack on Reagan, all around covering up the deceitful life that Parker was leading. Also during the court proceedings, the prosecution demonstrated just how malevolent her nature was. They showed the lies, the deceit spanning years. They revealed a person who had spent much of her life manipulating others to just gain attention or sympathy or get financial benefits from them. Her most significant and elaborate lie was around the false pregnancy. She covered that for nearly 10 months. She went to great lengths to convince her boyfriend, her friends, her family. She got fake ultrasounds. She purchased them so that she could convince others that she was actually pregnant. She doctored sonogram photos. She claimed to have medical documents that literally showed her supposed pregnancy progress. She even wore a fake pregnancy belly so she could create this illusion of a growing pregnancy. I do find it weird that Wade, her partner, didn't realise because I think our partner steers naked all the time, but I guess she could just have pretended she wasn't maybe interested in intimacy during that period of time. When you're pregnant, you don't always have a great sex drive and she could pretend that she didn't like her body, so she wanted to cover up. So I would imagine she could have got away with it that way, but I still think it's really strange. Witnesses actually said, that they had seen her at various stages of pregnancy and they genuinely had bought into it. They didn't realise it was a facade at all. All the social media posts that she put out there, this is what the prosecution are using. They're saying, don't tell us that this is something that's not premeditated. She has maintained the lie in an adept manner, spanning months before carrying out this murder. And they brought in information that she fabricated pregnancies before. She told family, she told friends, she told multiple romantic partners that she was pregnant in the past. Each of these pregnancies ended with various fabrications, including things like miscarriage or complications, all of it about trying to garner sympathy and attention. She was somebody who desperately wanted to be the centre of attention at all times. And also, when you look back at her history of medical issues, the prosecution brought in all the health conditions that she claimed to have that, again, were fake. 
She told people that she needed surgeries that never happened. She manipulated people into giving her emotional and financial support because it worked for her. The fraudulent financial activities the prosecution brought in. She was so deceptive. She got track record of engaging in lots of different schemes to defraud people. So in the years leading up to the murder, she was involved in check fraud. She issued bad checks to people, bad checks to businesses. She had false bankruptcy claims. That was in 2019. She literally lied about her financial status. So she's quite happy to deceive people on multiple levels. She even lied about her background. I mean, she fabricated the craziest stories. She was telling people that she was related to really rich people, that she was really successful. She lied about owning property, about having wealth, even though we know she had financial woes. But this was all so she could keep up this idea of a stable and successful life. And when you think about Wade Griffin, her boyfriend, he was lied to enormously. She fabricated so many stories, she created an entire narrative around their life together, including, of course, the fact that they're meant to be expecting a child. She misled him into absolutely believing that she was pregnant and that she was gonna give birth in the months leading up to the murder. And she lied about various medical issues, about the visits to hospital, about the absences at work. She'd even told people that she was an heiress and that she had an oil fortune worth millions of dollars. She went as far as putting in offers on expensive properties, one worth millions. And this was all by leverage false claims that she was wealthy and creating this illusion that she had these significant funds. She even gave real estate agents fake documentation and references. So this is what the prosecution had built up. This is a woman who had gone out of her way, yes, to create an absolute fabric of lies, but she knew exactly what she was doing. This was a woman who wanted to be seen as special and she didn't care about the consequences. It was about her justification in the moment. It was about wanting what she could get in that moment second. So yes, she wasn't sophisticated, but she never intended to be because it was just about getting whatever that was important to her in the second that she could get it. And think about a psychopath. That's what they do. They see what you have. They want it. They cultivate a situation where they can achieve it. Now, none of you are going to be surprised to know that the jury was unconvinced by Parker's awful defence and she was actually found guilty of capital murder in October 2022. Now, wow, when it came down to the victim impact statements, they were absolutely devastating beyond devastating in fact they were so emotionally charged and they were delivered by reagan hancock's family they expressed their absolute pain their loss the horror the loss of future over the murder of reagan and of her beautiful baby her mother jessica she delivered one of the most poignant and heart-wrenching statements and she directly confronted taylor parker she described the sheer horror of discovering her baby daughter, because I know that Reagan was 21, but for her mother, she's a baby daughter. That's her little girl. And she had to discover her body broken and savaged by Taylor Parker. She said, my baby was alive, fighting for her life when you tore her open and ripped her baby from her stomach. She also recounted the moment that she found Reagan in a pool of blood and she just painted this really vivid and tragic picture of the impact that Parker's actions had had on the family. She talks about her immense grief, the devastation, the somehow having to come to terms with this violent and senseless act and the fact that they've lost not just the future of Reagan, but also of the beautiful child she would have had. Homer Hancock, who's obviously Reagan's husband, he shared his pain, his heartbreak. He said that the magnitude of his personal tragedy was just impossible to navigate. The life that they built together had been destroyed. He described the crushing reality of living without Reagan, saying that he hadn't just lost his partner and his best friend, he'd lost the child they were expecting. He'd lost the sibling for his daughter, the future. He spoke about his emptiness, about his despair, about how it had irrevocably changed his life and the lives of his family and the lives of his friend. So, so many people from Reagan's family just absolutely coming together to acknowledge the huge loss that they've suffered. And also, like I said, the loss of that potential. 
Now, one of the people who testified in the trial was a woman called Shauna Ray Yeager. She was actually incarcerated with Parker in December 2020, and she actually sent a letter to the DA's office in March telling them that Parker had actually told her some details about what had happened during the morning of the murder. She said that Parker had told her that she'd initially tried to use a knife from Hancock's home to cut the baby out, but couldn't do it. She then went to a car, so imagine this protracted attack and walking out of the house, going and get a scalpel from a medical kit in her purse, to which she then finished the job with. Now, allegedly, Parker told Jaeger that she then placed the baby up against Reagan's cheek and told the baby, tell mama bye. Now, if that actually happened, Taylor Parker was assured literally a cell in hell, genuinely. Jaeger also told the jury that Parker said that she'd headed to the hospital with the baby so she could get a record of her birth. She also told Jaeger that she pulled over when the baby stopped breathing and didn't actually mention that she'd stopped because she got pulled over. She said that she took the cord into the pants and that the EMS crew assumed the baby was her. Now, I will say that that testimony was questioned by the defence because she'd sent the letter when she'd been hoping to get probation reinstated but she didn't actually receive anything in return for that information. And I can imagine that a woman, whether you're somebody who's incarcerated or otherwise would be really moved by some woman telling you that information and knowing that some woman had lost her baby and lost her life in such a horrendous way and you had information about that. I'm not saying it absolutely is truthful, but I just wanted to point it out because if she did that, if she murdered Reagan and then put the baby to her face and said, say bye to mama, that demonstrates a level of depravity and horror regarding her personality that is almost incomparable in the world. We're talking the kind of human being that is the most dangerous to our society. Now, during the trial, Taylor Parker said that she had been told of her right to testify, but she didn't take the stand because she isn't going to because she come across as a massive liar. And you won't be surprised to know on October the 3rd, 2022, this is after less than an hour of deliberations, Parker was convicted by a Bowie County jury of capital murder by terror threat or other felony. Following that conviction, she would either be sentenced to death or life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, during the sentencing hearing, prosecutors made it very clear that they were seeking the death penalty. Parker's defence team asked for life in prison. One of the things that the prosecutors pointed out was that just a litany of bad behaviour and criminal acts committed by Parker since her actual arrest. On the stand, Idabel Police Department Detective Johnny Boss gave his testimony. He said that he had to pause to gather himself as he described his confusion and his anger at seeing what appeared to be a healthy baby die in hospital. He recalled a nurse who was just crying as the baby was hooked up to machines, barely keeping the baby alive. After he was told the baby wouldn't survive, he literally had to leave the room. The nurse stayed with the baby so she wouldn't die alone. Prosecutors also showed a jury a photo of the baby laid out on the table, still intubated with wires attached, and people were heard crying in the courtroom. Dr. Christopher Mason, he testified that Braxlin would have been born completely healthy under normal circumstances. Also, the supervisor of the jail's medical staff also took to the stand. They talked about how Taylor Parker's medical calls and visits to the hospital were really problematic, and they started soon after she arrived at the jail. She said that Parker had been the most frequent visitor to sick call she'd ever seen, and also one of the most difficult prisoners she's ever seen. She said it's been quite challenging. Sometimes we have to go down the rabbit holes to find information on her, and sometimes at the end of the rabbit hole, we don't find anything. In addition to sick calls at the jail, Gilchrist, who was the person I was just talking about, the supervisor, she said that Parker had been taken to Wadley Regional Medical Centre at least 10 times after complaining of various symptoms from tightness in her chest and shortness of breath to vomiting blood. And she also said she had a bleeding ulcer. And every time Gilchrist said that Parker received a full battery of tests and every single one of them came back showing no medical issues. After one visit, Parker actually claimed it was because of her crime that one of the doctors refused to treat her. However, that was clearly not the reason. It was that her medical record showed nothing was found. Parker also claimed a history of multiple sclerosis, stroke, pulmonary embolisms, as well as a rare blood clotting disorder. The doctor said, yeah, she has none of those. 
Gilchrist also recounted how Parker repeatedly indicated on medical forms that she did not have a history of sexual abuse. It's one of the questions that they ask. Although she did mark yes on a question asking whether she felt she was at risk for sexual abuse or assault in the jail. But then three months later, Parker demanded access to mental health counselling and claimed for the first time that she did have a history that included sexual abuse. Also, Gilchrist testified that in April 2022, Parker started to claim that she was hearing voices, but those have miraculously seemed to resolve themselves. So, like, everything she could have had since she's gone to prison, she's had. Also, to jail medical staff, Parker was constantly aggressive. In one incident, she got mad, kicked the door and said, I'm not putting up with this shit, and left. In another incident, Gilchrist heard Parker tell a male inmate waiting outside the medical room who basically complimented her on her looks. She said, you obviously don't know who I am and what I'm capable of. Well, what you're capable of is killing a vulnerable pregnant woman. Hardly a threat to a male inmate, but that again tells you of this woman's mindset. Gilchrist also said that Parker filed a false complaint against a nurse at the jail, claiming that she basically didn't get any medicine. So jail policy was ultimately changed once again to require that two nurses be in the room at all times when dealing with Parker. So she's a real problem for them. Jurors were also told by more corrections officers that they had really problematic interactions with Parker. So Parker accused corrections officer Amber Monk of threatening to cut her throat and using a racial slur. Parker had also been known to threaten other officers with grievances and legal action. So this means that some of the officers were so scared that they let her get away with things such as possessing contraband because they didn't want to get into trouble. And Parker was also said to have a really apparent fascination with coverage of her trial, which demonstrates the same kind of mindset as somebody who's a serial killer. They're so egocentric that even though it's about them in a negative way, they just can't help but be interested in what's being said about them. So this is why the prosecution are painting this picture. They're basically saying, look, this woman has gone out of her way to do things like attempt to frame a fellow inmate for murder, possession of contraband, manipulating, threatening and bullying corrections officers and jail staff into allowing violations of security protocols. She's got a history of fake sick calls. She's a woman who we cannot trust even when she's incarcerated. So they're saying as a prosecution, life in prison is gonna give Parker way too much opportunity to scheme and to cause chaos in jail. Let's kill her. That's basically their argument. Now Parker's mother, Shona Pryor, she was the first person to take the stand in her daughter's defense. She talked about how difficult her childhood was, her weight issues, her medical conditions. She also told the jury that Taylor Parker loved her children, that she was a good mother. Well, are you a good mother when you steal from the womb of another? I would question that. She said that basically the children love Taylor Parker. Again, whilst they don't realize that the mother's a heinous murderer. Also, the jury was shown several pictures of the family. They were played several jail calls between Taylor Parker and her children. And yeah, Taylor Parker was nice to her kids on the phone, told them they should get a good night's sleep, etc. But that doesn't make up for what this woman has done. And don't get me wrong, her mother also acknowledged that Taylor Parker had this really long history of lying, that she was a manipulator, that she was somebody who went out of her way to cause pain just to get what she wanted. And one of the things they said was, listen, you know that Taylor Parker was saying she was pregnant, but you knew that she'd had a hysterectomy. But her mother said, yeah, but I genuinely didn't think that I was being manipulated. What? She admitted on the stand that she knew her daughter wasn't pregnant, but she didn't think she was being manipulated. What? She said, she knew she wasn't pregnant. We knew she wasn't pregnant. There was no need to come up with a plan. We figured the lie would be exposed. You would figure it out. I'll tell you how a lie is exposed. It takes two people to lie, so if one person refuses to continue that lie, it gets exposed. Why didn't you pick the phone up? Chain of causation. Clearly, Taylor Parker's mother's not responsible for what she did to Reagan, but I'm telling you this, if she had outed that lie, Wade wouldn't have gone through the distress of realising he wasn't going to be a parent, and Reagan's family would still have Reagan. So you don't say it's okay for this daughter to just not be accountable, not be responsible, carry on a lie to a point where somebody dies? That's when it's going to get figured out? That's horrific. She did say that she agreed her daughter was blameful for the crime, but still, what did she do to prevent that crime? Nothing. Turns out that Taylor's mum and new husband have actually won custody of Taylor Parker's daughters, but at the end of the day, 
like I say, I really struggle with the fact that they think just letting time pass so that in the end, the pregnancy would be exposed as not being real. That's not good enough. They allowed her boyfriend Wade to have his feelings played with and the family to all be aware of the fact that she was apparently pregnant when they all knew it wasn't real. Why didn't they confront that situation? Now, over 26 days of testimony, jurors heard from more than 130 witnesses, some of them more than once. And during closing statements, prosecutor Kelly Criff said, the circumstances in which Reagan died are horrible and there is no doubt it was torture, but a mother died fighting for her child. That's how she left the world. A woman who died fighting. She slashed her hundreds of times, said Chris, who showed a photo of the crime scene to the jurors. She beat her with a hammer. You're going to say she's not violent. She ripped her uterus out by the back. Look at what she did. Taylor Parker's attorney, Jeff Harrelson, told jurors that, quote, words can be used to dehumanise and said that they are layers and shades of grey to people's lives. He said, she is human. I would question that, but... This is what he's saying as a defence. He described Parker as a, quote, woman, daughter, sister and mother, a reprehensible human being, a murderer and child killer. Sorry, I did the last few, but we can all agree that that's true as well. He also said that Parker was let down by her friends and family as they didn't confront her about the fake pregnancy. Yep, I agree with that. But at the end of the day, it still lies with her. He said there was no safety net when everyone saw the wheels were off. He pointed out that Parker has not had any disciplinary actions against her while she has been in jail and suggested that the prosecution exaggerated the chaos and problems she has caused while behind bars. I'm just going to throw it out there. Yeah. The prosecution just brought loads of witnesses in who said she's created loads of chaos behind bars. We get to the 9th of November 2022. It was just after an hour of jury deliberation. They returned with a sentence for 29-year-old Taylor Parker. The jury found that Parker was likely to continue committing acts of violence that posed threats to society. They also found that there were no significant mitigating circumstances in Parker's background that should lead her to being sentenced to life in prison instead of death. Yet the story about being overweight when she was a kid is not going to wash with people. At the end of the day, that is not traumatic enough to create the kind of killer we're talking about today. The Texas jury sentenced Parker to death. She remained still as the verdict was read out. She was apparently seen shaking and crying when she was formally sentenced to death. Some of Reagan's family members took to the stand to give their impact statements. In a statement to the court, Reagan Hancock's mother, Jessica Brooks, addressed Parker as an evil piece of flesh demon. She said, my baby was alive, still fighting for her babies when you tore her open and ripped her baby from her stomach. You watched her die. You did not care about Braxlin either, spending so much time making sure you would not get caught. Apparently at this point, Parker did start to sob as Jessica continued. She went on to say she was one of the very few, very few people on this earth that cared about you. So every time you think to yourself, oh poor me, nobody cares about me. No, that's the truth. Jessica said now that all she wants is to keep Reagan and Braxlin's memory alive and the only time that she would mention Parker would be to remind people of her evil. She said, I will continue to remind people of this world how evil you are for the rest of your life, however short that may be, but only if I hear mention of your name. Otherwise, I will not speak of you, only of my beautiful baby girl Reagan and grandbaby Braxlin, who were a light God will continue to use in this dark world. You took their breaths, but you did not get their beauty and light that will shine for years and years to come. Reagan's sister, Emily Simmons, also addressed the court. She said that at her upcoming wedding, she'll have to carry a picture of Reagan down the aisle because her sister won't be there to act as a maid of honour. She said, my only biological sister, you need to understand what you took from me and my family. No more celebrating her birthday. I was barely 19. When I got the call, my sister was gone. She said, she will never be my maid of honour. If I visit my sister, I have to go to a graveyard to see a headstone. I'll never get a text or a phone call from her again. Reagan's widower, Homer Hancock, 
he had his sister-in-law read his statement. It talked about how he had to move in with his parents, with his little girl, how he had to start his life all over again and the heartbreak of losing another daughter he never met. He said, the first time I got to hold Braxlyn Sage, she was cold and lifeless. I will never see her eyes or hear her say, I love you, daddy. After listening to the victim impact statements from Reagan's family, Judge John Tidwell told the bailiff, you have been found guilty of capital murder and punished by Texas law to death. I formally sentenced you to death. Take her to death row. So the judge had no issue with the jury's decision. In death row, by the way, Taylor Park will spend 23 out of 24 hours a day inside a single person 60 square foot cell. She's only allowed four visits a year. This will be done behind glass and she'll have four calls a year for five minutes each. What I'm saying there, guys, is she's going to have a lot of thinking time, isn't she? She's going to have a lot of analysis time. And she's not going to get to cause chaos because there aren't going to be people around her to cause chaos with. I don't know what your thoughts are regarding the death sentence. I'm always very conflicted. But what she did to Reagan, what she did to Braxton, it is something that if a death sentence were ever accurate, I would genuinely believe it applied here. I hope I've done this case justice. It was a really big one. I know I've got a lot in this, but I hope that you understand the gravity, the depravity, and of course, the most important part, the loss that has occurred in this case. I'd love to know your thoughts. Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you again next time. Look after yourselves.